Hello everybody, this is Joseph D. Farrell with News and Views from the Nefarium on September 1st, 2022. And this is actually take two. I recorded it earlier, just a few minutes ago, and I ended up sounding like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Anyway, let's get right to it. There is no vid chat tomorrow. Remember folks, no vid chat tomorrow. It'll be a week from tomorrow. I want everybody to... Enjoy a long Labor Day weekend, and uh, on Monday I might be recording with Daniel List and my cousin. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that I had no idea that my cousin was connected with, and so we're going to be doing kind of a joint, joint dark journalist Giza Death Star interview of my cousin on uh, Monday, Labor Day Monday. So hopefully that will come off. Now, you may have missed it, but Russia and the Ukraine came to a close to a negotiated settlement in April of this year. And then Bojo, that is to say Boris Johnson, stepped in and messed it all up. And there's an article about this whole thing over at Zero Hedge that I want to bring to your attention. I'm going to read several paragraphs from it. And then conclude with what I think this whole Ukrainian mess is all about. So here we go. The article's titled, Western Allies Led by the United Kingdom's Johnson Sabotage Tentative Ukraine-Russia Peace Deal in April. Quote, there is mounting evidence that the war in the Ukraine could have been over by this point, but key Western backers of Kiev sought to sabotage the potential for peaceful settlement through negotiations. That's precisely what regional Ukrainian media reports concluded as early as May, soon after the United Kingdom's Boris Johnson showed up in the capital on a surprise visit to meet with President Volodymyr Zelensky for the first time the month prior. This is what a bombshell story in Ukranska Pravda said at the time, but which was almost completely ignored in Western mainstream media. Quote, According to Ukranska Pravda, sources close to, to Zelensky, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson, who appeared in the capital almost without warning, brought two simple messages. The first is that Putin is a war criminal. He should be pressured, not negotiated with. And the second is that even if the Ukraine is ready to sign some agreements on guarantees with Putin, they, the United Kingdom and the United States, are not. Johnson's position was that the collective West, which back in February had suggested Zelensky should surrender and flee, now felt that Putin was not really as powerful as they had previously imagined, and that here was a chance to press him. Via the Sydney Morning Herald, Prime, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson made a, quote, top secret, unquote, visit to the Ukraine on April 9th. The Ukrainian media, English language report, went on to emphasize that three days after Johnson left for Britain, Putin went public and said talks with the Ukraine had, quote, turned into a dead end, unquote. Now, skipping a paragraph. As the invasion ordered by Putin pressed on, Britain especially was the earliest out front with making large weapons and munitions deliveries to the Ukraine via military transport planes a high priority. The United Kingdom press reports also took note of the convenient timing of London going all-in hawkish on the Ukraine, given Prime Minister Johnson's enduring Partygate scandal at home. And, skipping some paragraphs, former U.S. official at the U.S. National Security Council, Fiona Hill, has co-authored a lengthy essay recounting key moments in Russia's war and the Western efforts to, to aid the Ukraine thus far. She let slip the following key confirmation in the Council on Foreign Relations run Foreign Affairs Journal, quote, According to multiple former senior U.S. officials we spoke with, in April of 2022, Russian and Ukrainian negotiators appeared to have tentatively agreed on the outlines of a negotiated interim settlement. 
Russia would withdraw to its position on February 23rd when it controlled part of the Donbass region and all of the Crimea, and in exchange the Ukraine would promise not to seek NATO membership and instead receive security guarantees from a number of countries. But as Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated in a July interview with his country's state media, this compromise is no longer an option, unquote. Now, I've thought most of the day as I'm trying to figure out just what all of this means. I think the Ukrainian war can be boiled down to an effort to deal with two problems at the same time. In other words, once again, Mr. Globaloni is multitasking or stacking functions, as Catherine Fitz likes to say. And the first is they're using the Ukraine. The political class in the West are using the Ukraine, number one, as a distraction from their own poor domestic policy record. I mean, my word, just look at at Western Europe right now and the ridiculous energy prices some people, particularly in the United Kingdom or Republic of Ireland, appear to be paying. I saw an article just before I came on to do this news and views of a lady in Ireland that received an electric bill, a power bill, for the past three months that was in excess of $10,000, in excess of 10,000 euros, which is, uh, quite frankly, folks, an absurdity. Um, so in other words, they're, they're using the Ukraine as the excuse for their own policy failures and ineptitudes. They can blame it all on Putin when, in fact, Europe would not be in this mess had it not bought on to all of this ridiculous green energy nonsense and countries like Germany shutting down all of their nuclear plants and their coal plants and so on and so forth. This is an absurdity, folks, plain and simple. And the people in Europe and the Ukraine especially need to wake up and realize that their political class needs to stand trial, not be elected to further office. Um, I, I can't think of any other reason for all of this other than that Mr. Globaloni deliberately wants to impoverish the middle class of the West and wants to turn whoever managed this to survive that process into chattel slaves. And yeah, Klaus von Bloschwab, I'm talking about you. The other thing that I think they're trying to do is, is to situate the Ukraine itself as a key component within their new world order. And what do I mean by that? Well, many years ago, I pointed out on, on George Ann Hughes' show, The Bite Show, this was over a decade and a half ago now, that one reason the Ukraine was so important was because big agribusiness, including Monster Santo, had negotiated special privileges in the Ukraine to introduce GMO foods into that country. And guess what family was involved? Yeah, you've guessed it the family of the alleged president of the United States right now. So that's just one of the stories. The other thing that I think they're using the Ukraine for, they want to keep this going on as long as they can to achieve their other objectives, including the energy objectives I've just mentioned. But they're also using it to cover up their own failures as a leadership class. These people do not deserve our trust. Uh, kudos to the Ukrainian negotiators who negotiated that deal with Russia. It's a pity your leadership is beholden to the Western leadership. Otherwise, this war would have ended by now. So what are they using the Ukraine for? Well, if you've looked at the ridiculous amounts of money that the United States is willing to spend on fighting a war in the Ukraine and securing their borders, while at the same time keeping our borders open and insecure, ought to tell you just how much the American political class is in the camp of average middle class Americans. In other words, the same thing needs to be said about the political class and leadership in this country as in Europe. They don't give a damn about their own countrymen. So what are they doing? Why send all this money and 
for that matter, all these weapons to the Ukraine. And folks, remember, it takes more than weapons to fight wars. It takes people trained to use them. And this is where we're wasting money because the Ukrainian military has basically run out of its trained soldiers and is now is now resorting on fast training of basically raw recruits. This is not a, a good situation militarily to be in. So where what's happening? with all that money and all those weapons. Well, frankly, I suspect very strongly that the Ukraine is being used as a transshipment point and as a money laundering operation, and that that money and those weapons are actually, for the most part, going elsewhere. Now, some of you out there have already sent me articles about how some Ukrainian oligarchs are actually selling these weapons on the black market for a very sturdy profit. And that would not surprise me. I think you're dealing with a lot of transshipment and money laundering here in the guise of, of aid to the poor beleaguered Ukrainians. And this, this is part of the problem. And I'll go even further and say that I believe a lot of this uh, is also tied to human trafficking. I think for the moment, the Ukraine has emerged as a central hub in the human trafficking networks and that this is all somehow related to it as well. Um, and then, of course, in the background, we have the recent assassination of uh, Daria Dugina, the daughter of the Russian geopolitical philosopher Alexander Dugin. So a lot going on in the Ukraine. Keep your eyes peeled for stories about weapons transshipments, money laundering, and even human trafficking connected with all of this. Because I have a feeling that the Russians, as they've been gathering evidence from the bio labs, evidence about the Dugana uh, car bombing, and so on, that they are probably uncovering a lot more stuff. And I strongly suspect that if they've uncovered fairly solid cases, they will be going public with those cases. And even if those cases go all the way up to and including some of the current leadership of Western countries, I think, I think the gloves have really come off in the last couple of weeks. So this is one to watch, folks. Remember, there's no vid chat tomorrow. We're going to have a long weekend. I'm going to be doing a special show hopefully on Labor Day Monday. And uh, we'll see you for the vid chat a week from tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody, and God bless.